Tim, thanks so much for joining us again. You're a, a, a double World Cup winner. You know how to win these tournaments. You know what it takes years out to get to the stage where you can have confidence in your team and your squad. A 36% winning record for Australia this year. I know it looks kind of gloomy, but we go through the results, mate. And from this side, you know, you've had so many near misses against teams. Is is, is that relevant when assessing where Dave Rennie sits and where the, where the team's been this year? Yeah, Martin, I think it is because, you know, when you look at the way that, uh, you know, the Wallabies probably should have beaten France in Paris, um, a little bit unlucky against du- in Dublin against Ireland. So we're getting close. We're not far off, um, but, but in some respects we are. So I think you just need to have a good look at, especially the injuries that the Wallabies have had. They've used 50-odd players this year and um, some key injuries. You know, you look at Samu Karevi, you know, Quade Cooper, um, you know, Rob Valentini in the last Test match. So some really big names that have been out. So... I think it's good time to test those younger players, try and create some depth, you know, 10 months out from a Rugby World Cup because you're going to pick up injuries through Super Rugby and there'll be some key players out and you don't want to, you know, back on, you know, having the best number 10 ready to go and then all of a sudden he's injured and you've got to try and work out who's your next, you know, second or third best fly half. So, yeah, at the moment the Wallabies are probably struggling a little bit to work out who's their best number 15, who's their best number 10 and a couple other positions as well. But... I think it's tracking okay, you know. Yeah, look, I mean, look, it's a results-driven business. I understand that. And I know that, you know, test match rugby, there's no room for failure. There's no coming second or anything like that. But effectively, you had what looked like, I don't want to be insulting, but maybe a C team out there against Wales. It shows that there's a lot of character still in the team to come back from a 20-point deficit or 21-point deficit in any test match, Tim. I mean, it's got to be applauded, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, and and also their school level that's been picked up the last sort of probably eighteen months to two years. They've been working very hard on their catch pass game, the width in their game, and also been able to understand when to play and back each other. I think that's what's happened with the Wallabies now. They they trust the players around them, and um, you know, the, yes, they are creating more depth. There's a, as I said, there's been a lot of players out. So that game against Wales, I mean, you you scored twenty one, you're down by twenty one points, and come back and win the test match. That's in any test match, that's huge. So. I think Dave Rennie's got a, a pretty good structure within the team environment, a very good culture. They want to play for Dave Rennie. They want to play for each other. And, um, you know, we're seeing some results of that. It's just a shame that, you know, we're just just lacking that little killer punch at the end of test matches. I mean, look, you know, we can sit here and talk about this, but the powers that be, the fish heads in charge, you know, the, the, the way that it's reported in the media, the kind of pressure and that, that everything that builds around, does he have the support? Does he have unconditional support from now through to the World Cup, Dave Rennie? Yeah, definitely, yeah. I mean, Rugby Australia supporting is One thing he probably does have to review is why, why are all these injuries happening to the Wallabies? So, some of them are just unlucky. Some of them are through contacts. But, um, you know, three or four Achilles, uh, a couple of ACLs for key members. So you probably just need to look at the review and go, OK, well, how's our strength and conditioning um, program? Um, why is this happening? Is it just unlucky? Is it just contact sport? And it's happening more often, but... Yeah, other teams are getting injuries as well, as well, but not as many as the Wallabies at the moment. Okay, so we're, after looking at all the Autumn Internationals, it's crazy that the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, in, in all of the Test matches that we played against each other this year, 13 wins each and one draw. It's a, it's setting up a World Cup, and everyone say this is a great thing for a neutral, isn't it? I mean, who is the best team? Do we really know, or is it five or six teams? Pick one out of the hat. Oh, I think you could probably pick seven or eight teams at the moment. Um, you know, there's you, even even Argentina. Um, you know, they they can upset someone. Even Japan might upset someone in their pool. So, um, you know, I, I think Scotland could beat Ireland in their pool. So, the way they've been playing. So, and the hard thing in, on the draw is the top four teams at the moment in the world. Um, you know, Ireland, France, or the All Blacks and the Springboks. Of course, of all in one side of the draw, all in Pool A and Pool B. So two of those teams won't make a semi-final. So it's a, it's it's going to be a, probably the most competitive World Cup that we've seen for a long time. I mean, pick one of those teams. Where are the All Blacks sitting at the moment? I mean, you know what it's like in this country. Tim Horan is with a double World Cup winner. Uh, we're never happy. We're never satisfied, mate. I mean, that last 10 minutes of against England were a real slap in the face. But I always like asking people who are outside of New Zealand to have a look at our team and what do you think? Well, I still think, and I said this a couple of weeks weeks ago, that the All Blacks, in my opinion, are still the favourites to win the World Cup. So, yes, you've got Ireland number one in the world. Yes, you've got France, who are going to be very hard to beat in their home World Cup. 
and that first test match for the All Blacks against France uh, and it will be incredible to watch that. But I think I still think the All Blacks, um, you know, they get a few players back from injury, got very good depth and understand how to play the game. Um, I just think the All Blacks, in my opinion, are the team to beat at the World Cup. Does the winner come from that side? And I ask you that because Ireland have had a great year where they've only just, I mean, they lost to France. France haven't lost to anyone. And then we saw the South Africans really impressive at Twickenham. I mean, that was the best that they've played in years. So does, does the winner come from those two pools, A and B? Uh, you At the moment, um, the way the seedings are, you'd think so. But, you know, two are going to get knocked out. So, uh, and then you look at the way England played in the 2019 Rugby World Cup. They had that one massive match against the All Blacks in the semi-final and put them into the final. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one to call. Um, of course, the Wallabies in the pool will end up, you know, finishing one or two in the pool and end up playing Argentina or all England in the quarter final. So, back down in Marseille where it all happened in 2007. So... Yeah, it's uh, it's a really competitive World Cup. There's still a lot of rugby to be played between now and then, and there's going to be some injuries to some key players, and that might hurt some teams that don't have as much depth in key positions. The shot clock timer that World Rugby uh, are thinking of introducing, wanting to stop the time wasting around the lineouts, the scrums, the stoppages in play, how long the TMO takes, and also the water boys on the pitch. Let's look at the water boys to start with because this is just infuriates me when I watch rugby league. Get off the pitch. What are you doing out there? Because we know they're delivering instructions, Tim. And you know, and I think that's, yeah. you know, also, I mean, to me, they're professional athletes. Surely these players can figure it out themselves without somebody barking in their ear every two minutes. Yeah, I know. It's uh, Well, I think the, the referees have done a really good job the last 12 to 18 months around, you know, trying to reduce the time wasting, trying to get, um, you know, uh, off the uh, water boys off the field. I still can understand why we need a water break after 20 minutes, and and it's you know 10 degrees in Wellington. But anyway, um, I think the fatigue factor's got to come into the game. And it, my belief is you know you have eight, you got eight eight replacements. I, I'd probably like to see yes, you have eight replacements, but you can only use four or five max. You know, so uh, and then that fatigue factor comes in, and then also that I think it's the big part that I'd like to see is I'd like to see us break away from world rugby just for super rugby laws. And if we can create our own laws that make the game more excitable here and the ball in play longer for super rugby, because we're pretty much in Australia, we're competing against AFL, we're competing against NRL, and the crowds that watch those games are huge because the game moves very quickly and there's less stoppages. So in super rugby, we have to try and reinvigorate super rugby with some laws to keep the game moving and I just think we, you know, you might have 10 different laws in super rugby, but then you obviously got to go back to the normal laws when you play a test match. So it can't be too much of a difference, but enough of a dis- dis- difference that creates that ball in play a lot longer. Yeah, because when we're watching the Women's World Cup, look, we've had Steve Hansen on the program, Wayne Smith on the program in the last week as well. And, you know, everyone's talking about the fun factor of watching the women's game. I mean, at that high level, I'm talking the semi-finals and the final, obviously, but the ball being in play, I know that, 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 that you know the kicking game's not the same, they're not kicking the same distance and things, but it's just the pin the ears back and running with the ball. There's just so much more fun, it seems. Test match rugby with men, it's so goddamn serious, and we need to actually see the skills of the players more, don't we? Yeah, we do, and that's uh, that's about sort of making the game uh, more adaptable, and so the ball's in play longer. There's less stoppages, um, and there's less sort of TMO interjection. I understand the TMO's got to come in if there's the referee's not in a good position, so that's why the TMO's there. But um, let's make it quick and sharp, and I think you know make the right decision, take our time, but don't be don't take two or three minutes. It should be it should be you know at least sixty seconds for a TMO to make a call. Um, the scrums, I mean, my belief, you know, if we do look at changing some laws and the, and the broadcasters have this opportunity, is you say, well, OK, well, there's you're allowed one scrum reset. So the scrum's allowed to collapse once. If it collapses a second time, it's a free kick and you cannot take another scrum. So the game moves on. OK, so that rather than actually look, this this infernal time where we spent, you know, I mean, I, I can't remember which game I was watching, but it was one of them where the last three minutes were just resetting scrums. and. And, and, and trying to actually crack the US market or trying to get new spectators involved, trying to broaden it. It's a bloody complicated game to watch at times, isn't it? Well, I think fans who don't watch a lot of the games, who watch other sports, and if they turn on to rugby, it's very difficult for them to follow it. So, you know, less scrums, uh, you know, less resets of scrums. It takes three or five minutes towards the end of a game. And, you know, one scrum reset, and the second scrum, if it collapses... You know, the referee's got to make a decision and do a short-arm penalty free kick to one team. Um, and then maybe he doesn't allow that team 
to take a quick tap. It is a free kick, but you can't take a quick tap because other players are on the ground. You've got to let them go back, uh, and then you can play on. And then that reduces the time of scrums, and fans, fans hate stoppages in sport.